everyone. My name is Kat Uden. I'm the South Florida Field Representative for Oceana. Thank you so much for tuning into our Ocean Steward Spotlight. We hope to highlight ocean stewards from diverse backgrounds, connecting more ocean lovers with stories that inspire them. So first, a land acknowledgement. Today, I am joining you from South Florida. I am fortunate to be able to do this work on lands that have been cared for by many indigenous communities of the past, present, and future, including the Council of the Original Miccosukee Seminole Nation Aboriginal Peoples, the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. We encourage you to learn more about their culture, experiences, and environmental priorities, and to do your best to support policies that integrate those conservation principles. For those not in South Florida, I invite you to explore the history and deepen your knowledge of the indigenous communities in your local area as well. All right, so I wanna welcome my guest, Salemi Hernandez. Salemi Hernandez is the Southeast Regional Coordinator for Citizens Climate Lobby of Florida. Citizens Climate Lobby covering Florida, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. She first learned about CCL in 2017, and she immediately signed up as a volunteer because she was inspired by CCL's mission to create the political will for climate solutions. She is currently enrolled as a political science student at Florida Gulf Coast University. She has been a grassroots activist and community organizer for many years in Florida. Prior to CCL, she volunteered as the co-host of a Spanish language TV talk show based in Southwest Florida. While in this position, she had the opportunity to research and conduct in-depth personal interviews with political candidates and politicians. She has been volunteering with a number of organizations advocating in Tallahassee for the environment and Everglades restoration. Like her father and grandfather before her, Salemi worked for the oil industry in Venezuela. In fact, she grew up in an oil town and saw firsthand the environmental and health hazards that came with the well-paid oil jobs. Once the oil industry became nationalized, Salemi moved to the U.S. and started on a very different path as a social justice-minded environmentalist. She began to volunteer with various groups, including the Waterkeeper Alliance, the Sierra Club, and Citizens Climate Lobby. She helped create a local chapter of the Pachamama Alliance, an umbrella organization that connects environmental and social justice organizations to work in the community. Salemi is the mother of two wonderful young boys who are her motivation to continue her work for a better quality of life for all. So welcome, Salemi. Thank you Thank so much you. for joining us. All right, and so Lemmy and I see each other at many different environmental uh, events around Florida, and it's always so nice to see her. She always has a smile on her face and loves what she does. And so thank you so much for, for joining us for Ocean Steward Spotlight. All right, first tell us a little bit about yourself, including how you got into advocacy. All right, so my name is Selena Hernandez, and I am I am joining you today for the, from the from Naples, Florida, the original land of the Kalusahashi tribe. Um, as a city, my work as, in Citizens Climate Lobby is to support volunteers to build political will uh, for climate solutions. But how it really started in here. It was, you know, in 2017, you know, uh, as everybody else, you know, I bought my properties, you know, start, uh, after a seven years relationship, we got married and the market fell. And I realized that when you're doing everything right, sometimes the governments, uh, it, can, it can mess up your life or it can interfere. The decisions that the government makes can definitely affect your life. So in 2012, I started volunteer with the Obama campaign. And as the economy got better, I find my purpose doing something for my community and ultimately for me and my family. Um, continue my volunteer. I started volunteer with whatever organization I could with the time because I had a full-time job. I was a single mom. So, um, you know, whatever I could help, I, I was volunteer because I wanted to make my community better. But I really found um, 
my call in the environment because it's something that we all, no matter what kind of background you have or what are your experience or what is your ideology, the only thing we have in common is our planet and the face we use. So I really found that this was going to be something that could unite us. And the environment is really something, it's an it's issue um, intensifier or magnifier. I mean, it really accelerates any other issues, social issues, uh, racial, e economic. I mean, it intersects with all the social issues we currently have. So definitely that was my call. Uh, but what I tell everybody when people ask me, what do I need to do or, you know, in this movement, you know, I always go to the, to the indigenous knowledge. In order, why, in order to know what you need to do, uh, you need to know who you are. And what, what I mean who you are, who you are in the movement. So we live very busy life right now. We work a lot to kind of support and maintain our life. And we know that the money is not enough to support our family. I mean, um, and we're busy, it's a busy life. So do whatever you can, but be paying attention to what is your goal, what gives you purpose and joy. And that is your place in the climate movement or even in the social movement to create and change in the community. So yeah, that's a little bit about my story. And, you know, I do whatever I can. Uh, my mantra is really, you know, action is the antidote to despair. I don't think I would have this smile right now if I wouldn't do the work that I do and actually meet the amazing people I get to do this work with. And one of yours is you, Kat, and it's definitely a feeling a community and that you're not doing this heavy job alone. It's something uh, unbalanced for us as community organizers. That's so true. And it's so, it just, the earth is something that we all share and I can, feel that when we're at our events together and you know the last time we saw each other were down was down in the keys for the everglades coalition conference and we all just have this love of nature and respect for nature and it's just something that really connects us and can really span all political parties really right yeah wait well, you know there's a, a quote that i always refer to you know uh and it's a quote of eb white and, and he says, every day I wake up, turn, out, turn between the desire to savor the world and save the world. Uh, that makes it hard to plan the day. We in CCL add, if we forget to savor the world, what possible reason do we have for saving? In, 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 in the, the savoring must come first in order to save the world. So yeah. that's a dear quote of me. And, you know, we have to have that connection. I feel, you know, we ask so, of many people to protect nature, but many people live in urbanized areas and they don't have, they have that connection. You know, I think that connection should come first. And, and the protection, once that connection is established uh, with nature, we have the need to protect. Yeah, absolutely. And I can see you instilling that in your kids too, when you're taking them camping and taking them out in nature, just really, helping them fall in love with nature so that they'll want to save it too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes there can be despair out there, but I feel comfort too when I'm working on the environment that, you know, I'm doing something good and we're making progress. And, you know, that helps me a lot too. There's a lot of progress. You know, there's a lot of progress. The, the reality is that we see always the issues or the problems. That's, that's just human nature. The, the way we react, actually, we, we, we are very emotional. We're not rational. So that's why many of the decisions we're taking are, are not really rational, like, but they're, they're uh, emotional response to many issues. In that way, for one example of that is the cultural wars, for example. You know, we're really not rationalizing the issues. We are emotionally, you know, we're emotionally having that that dispute for those issues, but we're really not sitting down and communicating and really, you know, talking to each other. Yeah. All right. So um, how did growing up in an oil town impact you? I was talking about that in your introduction. How did that impact you? Well, it, you know, when I was living in the oil, in the oil, there were oil, 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 fossil fuel oils communities. 
And we didn't even know, you know, that was the industry of the country. Uh, that's where everybody went to work. And it was a pride, it was pride to go work in the old company. But I remember when I was a kid, the parks in front of my house were right next to oil pumps. In front of my house, there was a lake. And it's the only, I, I am from Maracaibo. And this is one of the only lakes in Venezuela that is connected to the Atlantic. And I remember this lake full of oil pieces of oil. Uh, later uh, in my life, my dad almost died. He, he was a, an engineer working in the perforation sites and he, con he, he contracted a bacteria that he almost died. Oh, wow. and, and, and that was because, you know, Venezuela, you're talking about a subdevelopment country where there's no regulations, you know, and if something, it's, there's no safety, they really don't care. Uh, but, you know, these families is what I see here, too, you know, it, these families, these are their, their employers. So we have to think about, you know, the, these people, their life, they're, they're, they're feeding their families and paying all their bills, the of these employers. So, you know, when we want to engage people that are, are the employers for this industry, we, we got to think about a just transition. Uh, that involve this uh, fossil fuel producers because these companies shouldn't be fossil fuel producers. They should be energy producers. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, and so you know, I see it here too. In many many places, people know people don't know they're being you know victim or of environmental injustice or you know they're being poisoned by any toxic in, in the environment. Uh, I didn't know when I was a kid and I was playing right next to an oil pump uh, with the risk to contract any of those unknown bacteria. Um, but yeah, you know, I think about, I think about that and it's, you know, how, how do you, how do you take this, how, how, I, 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 I figure out what was happening many years when now I'm in this, doing this work, but how did you bring those people you know, we have so much fossil fuel industry in the country, you know, so many people like the tense of this. How, how do we make them be part of the transition that they are the ones as employers of these corporations that are part of moving that transition? Yeah, and I think that's the job of, of, of us now is to show everybody the future in clean up and, um, and show that it's time to transition. And it's possible. It's possible. We just need to go and meet meet the people where they are. And you know, I think we, we, we lack of the capacity. There's no many people that do this. We all know it, right? Uh, but you know, I think it's a lot of meeting people where they are, educating them, and it takes time so, yeah. and patience. Yeah. But celebrating every success is what it keeps us going because this work is not easy and it could be very discouraging. Yeah, but we're, we're getting there and there are many victories. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> because of people like you. So thank you. Um, so fast forwarding to 2017, you and your family survived a Category 5 hurricane, but your community did not. How did Hurricane Irma change your perspective or motivate you to take action? Well, when Irma, <laughs> I was one of the ones that actually, I was with my community. You know, when Irma happened, I used to be a vet technician. I lost my job because the clinic closed for two weeks. And two weeks, the clinic went out of business. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we, were, we were three weeks without any electricity, without electricity. You know, that's, that's what the birth was. But we came together. The whole community came together. Um, um, and we got some funds. We rented two u um, two u to take, you know, basic needs to the farmer workers and to those under on un disadvantaged communities. Um, and, you know, that was super, super, um, rewarding, but, you know, there was one occasion, you know, that, that I, 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 I don't stop thinking about it, that we had, we were working with farmer workers that they didn't want to disclose their location uh, because they were, uh, they were afraid because their immigration status. So in this case, we, the community, a small group went to where they were and we, you know, with one of the U-Hosts took all the 
all the supplies to this community. But this is, you know, this is what this community was going through, you know, I mean, and, and it was amazing. That was, you know, when the hurricane happened, everybody came together. When, they, when the electricity came back, when I saw it, everybody went back to their house. <laughs> But the community that was formed when you go through crisis, that's why I always say, when you, go, when you are going through crisis, there's so many opportunities. It was amazing. And, and that sense of community can create so much more. And it was so sad to see when everybody, the electricity came back, everybody back into their house, you know, and, you know, neighbors don't talk to each other. But yeah. During this time we did, you know, people came, some other people didn't have water. They came to my house and, you know, I had water, not electricity. You know, I had people coming in and out, taking showers. <laughs> and it was that sense of community. We help each other. Let's cook here. Let's cook there. And that was wonderful. And really, you know, what it did show me is the power of the community when they come together. You know, they can accomplish anything they put in envision for sure. So I wonder also, you know, relating to that in Florida, I think that the strength of the hurricanes that we have, thinking about the hurricanes that we might have in the future uh, with stronger storms from climate change, uh, the rising seas, which we already see here in South Florida, does that make you think more about, you know, climate refugees and, and how it's going to affect underserved populations, how climate is going to affect them in the future? Absolutely. You know, I'm being working, we already seen this, you know, I, I have friends, uh, you know, my work is not just national, but international with the uh, United Nations climate change, uh, climate change, um, <laughs> UNFCCC. Um, and, you, you know, we have people in the islands of Caribbean in the Pacific that they're losing their land. Caribbean in the Pacific, in they're losing their life. They're, 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 they have already. We have, I mean, I have friends in Puerto Rico. Well, how many climate refugees didn't we have after Irma? We were talking about that today. These people were uh, without electricity. That's the worst part. You know, it's not a hurricane. Uh, it's what is coming after. If you get a big flood or you, uh, you have um, two, three weeks to six months, like in, in, in Puerto Rico without electricity. I had a friend that died. He, he was a little older and he, you know, when Irma happened, he had um, diabetes and he needed to have dialysis. And when he was transferred to Tampa, he passed. Oh, um, sorry. So, you know, it's, it, and, and we can, you know, we were talking about risk manager, risk management uh, when it comes to hurricanes. So it's a matter of organizing, especially the vulnerable uh, populations. We're talking about the elder, you know, I think that's that's pretty much the most vulnerable when it comes to this uh, 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 climate disasters. But you know, I think the the risk manager is up to the cities, it's up to the governments and the community. This is a, this is this is an, an initiative that everybody has to come together and care and be prepared. And we need to be prepared now more than ever. And I don't see that happening. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but I see the community. So the, my hope is in the community and you know the private sector coming together and pushing the legislation. Yeah, it's true. Um, it, for for those that aren't in Florida that are watching it, it's so true. After storms, the neighbors come out of their houses. You meet people that you haven't met before that you has lived down the street for years. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you're all sharing what do you need do you need a barbecue do you need gasoline do you need you know so it's you know do you need food do you need water it's 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 you can see the community come out after a storm that's so true so that's that's you know <laughs> one bright spot after the storm all right so i would like to know um your favorite ocean related campaign that you've on. Is there one that stands out that was especially meaningful, dramatic, memorable, or that taught you a lesson? So my favorite uh, water campaigns are restoration projects. Uh, we did an amazing restoration project before the 2018 um, uh, algae bloom crisis um, in the Calusahachi. And we put uh, cages on top so the uh, manatees wouldn't eat them and they would grow. This was a kind of seagrass that, you know, it was a hybrid that could withstand less light and more fresh water too. Uh, 
it was successful and there were my uh, there were my babies and we were very proud because you know it helped the water quality um it, I, I feel I love restoration projects I have I'm right now doing a uh, seagrass monitored with uh, FWC to you know just kind of see the the stage of the seagrass uh we I have done um horseshoe crabs tagging with FWC2 to study the population and kind of understand a little bit what's happening with them. Uh, I think I love that. I think that's like, you know, connecting with nature, hands-on learning. Um, it's my favorite. But one of the one of the campaigns that we're working right now, um, it's uh we're we're trying to get an amendment for water quality. Uh, so it's the right to clean and healthy water. Um, this is going to be a valid amendment for this year. Um, I'm going to I'm going to provide you with the link. Everybody can go ahead and sign. We need over nine hundred thousand signatures to pass this um, to to get this ballot to this amendment on the ballot for this year. And after that, when you have to vote, who doesn't want healthy and clean water? You know, uh, but. Really, really, really looking forward to this campaign. Um, we have also worked uh, with those water keepers. We were trying another uh, policy. We were trying to get a legislation for whatever there is fecal bacteria on the water. Uh, the health department just will put signs on those waters that are impaired. Uh, we didn't even get it on committee. So, I mean, <laughs> these are the things that, you know, we're not going to give up. I mean, simple things that is common sense. Don't you want to know there's fecal bacteria on the waters that you're kayaking or paddleboarding? Of course, yeah. But uh, why it doesn't go through? It's because we need more people loving their elected officials, making phone calls, and you know, telling them this is what we need because it's a public health concern. So. Really excited, there's a lot more we're doing, trying to get offshore drilling with Oceana. I love our collision. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to do. <laughs> so I I've, I've been seeing a lot about that petition, the right to clean water. And is there a particular organization who started that? How did that start? Well, the, this was um, the, right to, uh, the right to clean water. I mean, they have changed names before. Um, the right to bring water, and we started this. Uh, it was before the pandemic. We started this before the pandemic. Uh, they got the rights to. The, they gave the rights to nature in in Ecuador. They gave rights to nature in the Ecuador Constitution. And the lawyer that worked on that, he came down here to Florida to work with us to do the same. Uh, we the 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 approach that we took it was to uh, through a man uh, county charters, and we work in it, we work in where more, more of the people that were here in Orlando were working in to pass that chartered amendment, and it passed. And that same legislative session, which it was two legislative sessions ago, the Florida State Legislature legislators we entered the rights of nature. So now we didn't give up, and now we are going with the constitutional amendment option, which okay. we have more possibilities. Well, thank you so much for working on that. And uh, we're definitely going to put the link up and how people can, can look into signing that petition, what it's all about, so people can take action. What would you like to see for the future of the ocean conservation movement? Why? You know, I, I feel, you know, I, I would like to see conservation movement. There, there's so much. First of all, you know, we need to restore our waterways. I mean, there is so much uh, watersheds that are impaired. We have ways to get them with better water quality and we're not doing absolutely nothing. So these basin management action plans are just there <laughs> as a suggestions and their voluntary reporting. These basic action management plans are um, plans to kind of better the water quality of a waterway that is being impaired. Um, but, you know, the reportings are voluntary. There is not enforcement. Nothing has been better. So many restoration projects, but reality, reality, I feel that 
one of the things that I would like to see many people and many communities to do is get more into uh, citizen science activities, you know, restoration projects, maybe bird washing, you know, there's so many things, so many, the, our ecosystems are changing in front of our eyes. And getting the community involved and to kind of see those changes, how our ecosystems are collapsing are an eye opener. And, and, and you know that brings community, builds community and gets people involved in what's really happening. I think, yes, I, I would like to see a lot of citizen science, you know, a lot of people involved in the community. I, I, get, I do the citizen science, but I would love to see disadvantaged communities doing this kind of project. I mean, I understand that they might feel like this is science, you know, this is too big for me, but it's not, you know, and that's why we need to go to those communities and bring them to this, you know, ecosystems and kind of, you know, establish that connection. I would love to, uh, school class is, uh, you know, outside classrooms, you know, yeah. I, I feel like they teach biology in a boring room. Who's not going to fall asleep, you know, when you can teach it fun outside, you know, this is how nature works and it makes it more, more effective. It's, it's a more effective learning. So I would like to see a lot of that, you know, a lot of people in the ocean, not just, ah, you know, like, oh, I'm going to the beach and having a party. I throw, you know, trash all over the place. No, it's really connecting, you know, with the ecosystem. Look at the turtles, look at the, the, the animals in here. Yeah, that's so true. I, I, I feel like a lot of people go to the beach and they don't understand that they're in an ecosystem. They look at it as, as a place to party, like you said, a place to throw trash, play loud music. They don't understand that it's a turtle habitat and, you know, the sand is important, the dunes are important. And I would love to see more citizen science. And like you said, in schools as well, because I think if children grew up every year learning about the environment, they would... Uh, just show more appreciation, understanding about why it's important to protect it later. I bet you some of those barriers, they, they see one of those cute turtles. I mean, they, I bet you they won't be doing what they do on the beach, you know, if they see one of these amazing and majestic creatures, you know. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with you on that. Citizen science, I would advocate for that. And as a former public school teacher, I'm definitely in for more environmental education in, in schools every year, mandatory. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. All right. Um, can I ask you, what is your favorite marine animal? Manatee. Manatee, <laughs> yeah. I love manatees. <laughs> I love manatees too. And I paddle. And every time I see one, it's like it's the first time. I get excited every single time. I love them. They're so cute. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, our Florida manatees are in trouble right now. But yeah, because of the seagrass. Yes, yes. And, and you know, it, it, and I see it, you know, I hear scientists and people, so many simple things, like, for example, boats. People come here from all over the United States to vacation, and they don't even know that they're passing through these stones, that there is seagrass, and they're scaring the seagrass in a way that they cannot uh, bounce back. And they don't know it. And there's yeah. not in the state legislature, something to, you know, inform this. I, I mean, I, I don't think you get a license for boarding and you don't even have to do a test or kind of know these kind of things. So, you know, those are little details that can be maybe an ordinance, you know, in, in a sensitive area. Like we're trying to do something like that in Bonita Spring, for example. Um, so, you know, there, there's simple things that can be done locally that can have a big impact for our lovely, you know, manatees. I think, you know, whenever we cannot do the big one, it's always good to start small. And, you know, starting with those like local ordinance, you know, things like that, just voting speed, you know, protections for the sensitive areas. Um, yeah. It's like, I mean, yeah. yeah, definitely more education is needed, especially for people that are on or near the water, for sure. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience um, about how they can support your work, how they can support CCL and what they can do for your campaigns? Absolutely. Well, yeah, please join us. We need a lot of, we train you to become an advocate and that's what we need to make a change. Political will, it, 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 politicians don't create political will, they respond to it. And it's 
for us to create that political will. So please join us in Citizens Climate Lobby. We're completely free. We train you. We're going to have a conference in June in DC. You're welcome to join us. We're going to have Senator Whitehouse, which it has been a big climate champion for us. And um, we're going to do a virtual lobby day after that. Um, we trained you. Uh, please join us. Our elected officials need to hear what are uh, the, our issues and what are our demands, what are the solutions we want to be implemented. It's very important and it takes a long time, but we need to be constantly create an army of peaceful advocates that can bring this movement forward. So please join us. Please become an advocate. It, it's not hard. <laughs> what you you know what you have to bring to elected officials is really your story and why climate action is important to you. And that is something you don't have to be a policy expert. You don't have to be a climate change expert. You just have to say that. And that's something that no politician and nobody else can take away from you. And because they are the representatives, they should respond to your demands. Thank you. It's so important for people to learn to advocate and speak to their elected officials, get to know their elected officials. And even if you didn't vote for them, it's important that they know how you feel and what's important to you. So, you know, they they're, they represent you. And so it's really important that citizens go out, meet with their elected officials and tell them about what's important, right? Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Solemi, for being with us. I'm so glad that you joined. I've been looking forward to this interview, and I always look forward to seeing you at events. And we need to go. We've been talking about doing an, something outdoorsy together, uh, kayaking or something in nature. And, um, you know, it's so important to get out there and really enjoy and connect with what you're protecting because it gives you even more inspiration to do your work. Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing that I'm going to tell everybody, this work, being an activist is super cool. The people that you get to meet is the most amazing people That's you're very ever going to meet in your life. Yes. And we do have a lot of fun doing this work. I mean, it's challenging and we do get a lot of frustration, but we have an amazing support group of advocates that are going through the same thing, have amazing ideas, are super dedicated and really can move the needle forward because I've seen and done. Yes, I agree with that. We're good people. I agree with that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Salemi. And bye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Ocean Steward Spotlight.